This is my first video update for Wednesday in Athens, Greece. Let's talk about some news. And the big story that we have to talk about is uh, the EU uh, agreement to ration gas. <laughs> the EU, the powerful, the once powerful, indestructible force known as the European Union is now talking about rationing gas. So they're not actually talking about it. They've actually come to an agreement. The member states of the European Union have voluntarily agreed, after a lot of pushback, to uh, ration their gas supplies by 15%. They are going to cut back on their, uh, on their gas consumption by 15%. Of course, this is voluntary, and there were a lot of exemptions and uh, cutouts and all kinds of, uh, of give and take in order to get this to pass. And the, uh, the countries that are going to be exempt from this 15% voluntary, <laughs> I stress the word voluntary, rationing of gas are countries like uh, island nations, for example, Malta, Cyprus, Ireland, which are not on the continent's energy grid. They are going to be exempt from this voluntary 15% gas rationing. You also have countries like Portugal and Spain, which were very much against the initial proposals for this 15% uh, gas, gas reduction and they are going to actually have the uh, choice to, to go from 15% and ramp it down to 7% uh, gas rationing if they wish to do so. So they can sit at 7%. You also have countries like um, Poland. Poland said, you know what, we've got uh, enough storage to get us through the winter. And so, um, any excess, any excess energy that we have in storage, excess gas that we have in storage, that can be counted towards the 15% uh, voluntary uh, gas rationing benchmark. So Poland got away with that. Hungary, well, Hungary was, uh, was the one country that opposed this all the way till the bitter end. But eventually you got all EU member states to, uh, to agree to this. By the way, I'm in Plaka. This is the Plaka area of, uh, of Athens. And uh, this is the, the church right here of, uh, I believe it's Metamorphosis, I believe is this, uh, is the church here. Metamorphosis? Metamorphosis. Yeah, So, um, yeah, hunger was opposed to this, but eventually they got everyone to sign on. But um, the foreign minister of, of uh, Hungary, Peter Sjarto, he actually said that uh, this agreement is nothing more than political commentary. And in uh, technical, practical terms, this is going to be very difficult to to implement to enforce first of all the eu is saying that uh this 15 percent gas gas rationing is going to be um is going to be put on the uh, on the member states on the countries to uh to abide by it so the eu actually said in their communique they said that uh they're they're looking at the the member states to make and i quote uh, a best effort to uh, ration 15% of their gas. And that is the words they used, a best effort to, uh, to abide by the 15%. And so the fact that this is gonna be difficult to, to implement on a practical technical level, as the uh, Hungarian foreign minister pointed out is, is exactly right because I'm, I'm no gas or energy experts by no means, but I'm trying to, to understand how exactly this is going to work. For example, Greece. Greece was a country that was opposed to, to this 
they, they were saying, look, we, we can't go along with the 15% uh, reduction in our gas consumption and then take that gas and, and give it to Germany. So the exemption that Greece got is that if, uh, if they start to run into trouble, if the Greek uh, gas or electric um, grid or supplies, if they run into trouble, then they can opt out of this, uh, this 15% rationing. But a country like Greece, say they make a quote unquote best effort to ration 15% of their, uh, of their gas supplies. And the thinking is that you're going to ration 15% and you're going to give it over to Germany because that's what this is really all about. It's about bailing out uh, Germany, bailing out Robert Habeck, the vice chancellor of Germany who, who got the EU into this mess. But uh, you're going you're gonna to take 15% of your gas and you're going to do what, Greece? You're going to uh, put it on an LNG tanker and ship it off to Germany because last time I checked, Greece doesn't have pipelines that run from, uh, from Greece to Germany. So I think that the Hungarian uh, foreign minister is spot on by saying this is all nice political talk and political comment commentary you know we're uh, we're standing up to putin where the statements and russia wanted to divide us but we're showing that we're that we're unified and all these statements this is really nice to to say these things but in practical terms how are you going to pull this off how are you going to get each member state's gas to germany how are you going to do this um it probably can be done but <laughs> it's not going to be easy. This sounds awfully complicated. Why is, why is Germany putting themselves through this? For what? For Ukraine? Is there some sort of alliance or some sort of secret deal that Germany has with Ukraine that uh, says that should Ukraine come under, come under attack, Germany has to destroy itself, protecting it? I mean... <laughs> This is just so, so reckless, so bizarre that we're seeing Germany deindustrialize for the Alensky regime. So, yeah, that's, that's the problem with this agreement. It sounds, you know, really nice to come out and say that the EU is unified and they're not going to let uh, Putin blackmail them. That's what Habeck said in a statement. He says, we're not going to allow Putin to blackmail us. And we've shown solidarity, but practically speaking, I think that Hungary is calling out the EU on their uh, BS. And they're saying, okay, so you're going to get some countries to, uh, to ration off 15% of their gas supplies. And then what? And then what? You're going to send all of, these, uh, all of this gas to, to Germany on LNG tankers, along with the imaginary LNG from uh, Nigeria, Qatar, and the United States. How did that work out, by the way? Wasn't it Habeck that was boasting just a couple of months ago that the EU doesn't need Russian energy because we're going to get it from Qatar and from the US and from Nigeria now? How is that working out? The US is not sending the LNG anymore because they had one of their uh, LNG plants like blow apart <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. So they're also in a bit of a bind. So, I mean, all of this stuff is just kind of pie in the sky BS. The EU has no plan. And there was a political article that ran on this and, the, and it said that, uh, that when Hopic was pressed to provide numbers as to whether this 15% really does the trick and it solves Germany's uh, energy uh, problems, its gas crisis, Hoppick's response was, I haven't really seen the numbers. I haven't made the calculations. That's what Hoppick said. I haven't made the calculations. But he also said, every little bit that we can get from uh, EU member states helps. I mean, Germany's like sitting there with their hand out, begging for, uh, for gas donations. That is exactly what is happening. Every little bit we can get, he said, uh, helps out Germany. What a disgrace, what an embarrassment for, uh, for Germany. What a freaking embarrassment.
So the uh, the whole plan, initially the plan said, look, we have to we have to get 15% mandatory rationing from every EU member state. The mandatory is out the windows, is out the window. The 15% from each member state is out the window. And supposedly the 15% mandatory rationing, it was going to provide the European Union with 30 BCM, billion cubic meters of, uh, of gas. And that was going to be enough to get the EU passed a mild winter, to get it through a mild winter with no surprises. Those were the statements coming out of the European Union. And we're hearing from energy experts that given the structure of this agreement, in that it's not mandatory, it's voluntary, it's voluntary, and you have all of these exemptions and cutouts, the EU would be lucky to get 20 uh, BCM out of this uh, out of this agreement. Lucky to get that. And once again, this is this is saying that the winter is going to be mild, and there will be no surprises this winter as well. So, what the analysts are saying is that the EU needed, at a minimum, they needed 45 BCMs to get them through um, a regular, a normal, two a severe winter without any types of surprises. And if they really wanted to uh, to play it safe and to make sure they get through the winter, they would need something along the lines of 60 to 70 billion cubic meters in uh, energy rationing. And they're not even close to that. They're at somewhere south of 20 BCM. And that is if, that is if, the member states of the European Union voluntarily decide to uh, to get their gas to Germany because it is all about getting that gas to Germany. So all of this is uh, looks very, very shaky at best. It's shaky at best. So I don't know what this is. I'm going to probably have to go around and read what exactly this is but obviously this is very very old <laughs> and uh probably some uh some residents like the residents of the uh of the acropolis area right of the of the old acropolis athens city so it's just kind of sitting here on on a sidewalk as you as you walk up and down the the main street so that's what's going on with the uh with the energy with this energy rationing deal let me just read you here let me look for it let me read you the last paragraph of this political article which uh pretty much supports what hungary has been saying and what i've been saying in this video which is that this uh this 15 percent gas gas rationing deal is is a complete flop it says, uh, these are the last two sentences, sentences of the political article. It says, one thing is clear. On their own, Tuesday's warm feelings of unity won't be enough to heat households when winter comes. If it doesn't smell like solidarity and it doesn't look like solidarity, it probably isn't solidarity, a third EU diplomat said. They're kind of hinting that uh, EU countries are not going to really abide by this. They're not going to make their quote-unquote best efforts to uh to reduce gas by 15 percent and then send that gas savings to uh to germany they're not going to abide by this at all and uh this is not solidarity this is actually the exact opposite of uh of solidarity by the way the eu said they're going to set up a quote unquote union alert in that if things get really bad in the winter i.e if germany is collapsing which all indications show that the Germany the German economy is set to collapse. Then they're going to try to make this voluntary 15% uh, energy rationing into a mandatory energy rationing, and they're calling it a union alert. That's what they're going to designate it. But we'll cross that bridge when we uh, when we get to it, which will probably be around October, November, because if you've seen the prices, the charts which show the spike in price for uh, gas 
and for um, energy. In Germany, well, things are not looking good. I'm going to put a chart right now on the screen, which uh, they're calling this the horror chart, which suggests that Germany is heading for a huge energy crisis. Not only are gas prices near record highs, but electricity prices in particular are signaling stress. I think we have in Latvia record uh, prices for, um, for electricity, yeah. Increased by 186%. That's the energy prices have increased by 186% electricity compared to June of last year. That is a huge increase and we have the cost of gas in Europe now exceeding $2,300 per thousand cubic meters for the first time since the beginning of March. It is not looking good at all. So let's talk about Lavrov now and some of the statements that uh, he made when he was at, I believe it was the Arab down for a bit. I believe it was the Arab summit where Lavrov was making these statements. Lavrov was at a meeting with Arab League officials and he said, we are determined to help the people of eastern Ukraine liberate themselves from the burden of this absolutely unacceptable regime. Lavrov added that we, Russia, will certainly help the Ukrainian people to get rid of the regime, which is absolutely anti-people and anti-historical. This is the first time that we've seen a high-level Kremlin official allude to the fact that Russia is going to uh, depose of the Alensky regime. Now what that means, does that mean uh, an Alensky regime will be removed from its, uh, its authority in the Donbass Donetsk region? Does it mean that Russia will will save the Ukrainian people as Lavrov puts it in Kherson Zaporozhye? Does it mean all the way to Odessa or are we looking at all of Ukraine and are we looking at Russia signaling its commitment to, uh, to an Alensky regime change collapse throughout all of Ukraine? Don't know, but it was Lavrov who made the statement just a week ago saying that uh, the Russian military operation now is not going to be confined to Donetsk and Lugansk, that it is now going to uh, expand. And so one week later, you have Lavrov now saying that Russia will indeed liberate, free the Ukrainian people from the Alensky regime. That is a big statement coming from Lavrov. I wonder if this is, I'm, I'm certain this has been approved by the Kremlin. And I think it definitely hints to the fact that, uh, that Russia will indeed um, go all the way to Odessa at a minimum. At a minimum. That is what this is telling me. When, uh, when Lavrov said that we're going to free the people of uh, of this Ukraine Alensky government, he is without a doubt meaning the the Russian, the Russian speaking people of Ukraine. In other words, Donetsk, Lugansk, what is known as Novorossiya, Kherson, Zaporozhye, and of course the uh, the historical Russian city of Odessa. So that is what, uh, at a minimum, that is what Lavrov means now. Does it mean all the way to Lviv and to the border with Poland? <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? That is the million dollar question that everyone is asking. But uh, there's no doubt that the Alensky regime is in big, big trouble. They are, uh, they are now actually calling for free gas in the form of uh, LNG from the United States. So this is an uh, archaeological site of a Roman bath. Of a Roman bath. This area where a ventilation shaft for the Athens metro was to be sunk was excavated and investigated with important results. The archaeological finds were preserved 
in their place and the ventilation shaft has moved to southern so they were digging up for the metro here and they found this roman bath so i don't know if you can see it but here you go okay very cool so yeah as they were digging up the uh digging up to do the metro in athens they kept on running into all kinds of uh, archaeological finds and it would it would stop the the progress of the uh of the metro <laughs> until they and then they had to move it elsewhere or find another spot to uh to continue their work on the underground but uh i like the fact that they preserved it you know as you're walking in the street you just kind of hit upon this and uh that's pretty cool so yeah the Aletsky regime is um is saying that they would like a gas lend lease in other words not not free gas gas on loan and i'll tell you what's going on here and this is what the uh the prime minister of ukraine uh dennis i think it's dennis schmigal this is what he said in a statement uh, yesterday he said that uh, they would like in order to prepare for what is going to be a very hard winter they would like us lng provided in a kind of gas lend lease program so on loan very much like weapons like a military lend lease give us the gas and then we'll pay you over 20 30 50 years um, in the future and this is interesting because yulia timoshenko the mp and one time presidential candidate they call her the gas princess because she's like a multi-billionaire oligarch from her uh, stakes in Ukraine uh, energy gas companies. She came out with a statement saying that uh, Naftogas is involved in the scam of the century. And she said that uh, Ukraine's state-owned Naftogas gas company is supposedly running a massive embezzlement scheme as it seeks to get billions of dollars from the government for alleged gas purchases, even though Ukraine presumably does not need additional gas for the winter. This is according to Yula Timoshenko, who is in the parliament and is also the head of the Fatherland Party. According to Timoshenko, the lawmakers were about to pass several bills that would grant NAFTA gas additional funding for gas purchases ahead of winter. One of them would grant the company compensation from the budget that was worth 150 billion hryvnas, or $4.08 billion, to purchase an additional 6 billion cubic meters of natural gas. Timoshenko also said, or also claimed, that the government planned to use international financial aid provided to Ukraine by Western nations for that compensation Timoshenko's party wrote in a statement last week, according to Timoshenko herself, Naftogas also sought to request another 150 billion hryvnas or $4.08 billion from the budget to increase its authorized share capital and then use the money to buy gas. According to Timoshenko, Ukraine already produces and stores enough gas for the winter and might even get up to 7 billion excessive cubic meters of gas during the upcoming heating season. So those are the statements from the gas princess herself, Yulia Timoshenko. And on top of these statements with regards to naphtha gas and Timoshenko, we have statements that naphtha gas has actually defaulted on its debt. And this is coming in today on tuesday morning that ukraine's state-run energy company naftogas defaulted on its foreign debt the firm announced on tuesday naftogas was unable to make payments on euro bonds before a grace period expired the company said in a statement on telegram adding that it has not received consent from the cabinet of ministers of ukraine to make the necessary payments interesting that that they announce a default on Telegram. <laughs> that's, that's the first. The Ukrainian government earlier prohibited payments 
due on July 19th on its Euro bonds maturing in 2022 and 2024, citing the country's need to accumulate natural gas in sufficient quantities before the upcoming heating season. This is all par for the course for uh, a country like um, Ukraine. This is nothing new. Uh, corruption, embezzlement. Oh, th this is... This has been going on for you in Ukraine for about 20 years. So, you know, the, the only the only difference now is that the EU and the collective West is now on the hook for all of this stuff. That's the difference. NAFTA gas claims it had sufficient funds to carry out payments on its euro bonds and that it warned the government of the risks and negative consequences for NAFTA gas and the country of a possible hard default. However, according to the firm's telegram statement, the government's effective ban on payment means that the government defaulted on euro bonds of NAFTA gas. And now turning our attention to some more problems in Ukraine via the New York Times. The New York Times ran an article the other day saying that Ukraine's military morale is also in decline. There are signs five grueling months into the war that the sense of unity is fraying at the edges within the Ukrainian military, the New York Times pointed out in a report on Monday. Some soldiers are unhappy that they have done long, hard service, while many others managed to stay away from service, the article said. And there is no one to replace us. There are too few people. It's very hard for the guys psychologically. A Ukrainian soldier who'd spent five months fighting commented. There is also disillusionment among Kiev's troops with the country's draft system, which turns away some who want to fight due to bureaucratic reasons, while taking in others who are unwilling and unqualified. The New York Times reports that the New York Times, Times talks about how uh, Ukraine officials, they, they like enter discotheques and bars and all these types of estab establishments to look for people to draft into the military and how you just don't have experienced soldiers anymore in the uh, in the field. And what you do have is a lot of inexperienced um, draftees who have no idea what they're doing. And this is causing all kinds of uh, of unhappiness and disruptions in uh, in the morales and amongst the the commands. And basically, you're getting a picture from The New York Times that uh, that this is not going well at all. And I thought it was the Russian military that was uh, about to collapse. I thought the New York Times was telling us for the past three to four months that morale in the Russian military was at an all time low and that it was Russians and the Russian military that was entering bars and discotheques in order to draft uh, people to go fight in Ukraine. What, what was the New York Times saying or the Washington Post? The Russians are, um, they're drafting, oh, the Daily Mail, the Russians are actually going into prisons in order to, uh, to draft people to fight in Ukraine because Putin's war of aggression was going so poorly. But now we're finally getting the trickle truth as to what's really going on. And that is that four months of Russian military collapse was actually just projection. And it was Ukraine that is having morale issues and it is Ukraine that is having to, uh, to draft military aged men and even some men who are not military aged in order to fight in a war that they don't wanna fight in. So that was the latest revelation coming from the New York Times. Let's do a couple of clown worlds. And the first clown world has to do with Elensky's wife, Olena Zelenska, who is making a tour of the United States. She's doing her tour of the U.S. Olena Zelenska tours America. And uh, she decided to... Um, well, actually, this was actually done in Kiev. But, uh, but this article has come out now. This photo shoot has come out now. And she, along with her husband, decided that it would be a good idea for them to grace the cover of Vogue magazine, the digital cover of Vogue magazine. And they did this entire photo shoot and you'll see 
some images and uh, videos of this photo shoot on the screen right now and they thought it was a good idea for them while the country was in the middle of a war special military op operation invasion call it what you want that it would be a good idea for them to hang out with photographers and makeup artists and the Vogue staff and do a photo shoot and talk about how difficult it is for them hanging out at the palace in Kiev to deal with this, uh, this conflict. And in the videos, I don't know if you saw the videos, it was interesting to see how, how relaxed and, and happy Olena and Olensky appear to be. You know, they're, they're in their element, aren't they? Because they've probably done many photo shoots in the past, given the fact that they are uh, comedians, script writers, and, and TV personalities. So this is, this is uh, familiar territory for them. And, you know, they feel right at home doing these, uh, these types of, of photo shoots with Vogue. But boy, is this in bad taste. I mean, this is, first of all, it screams elitism, right? Which is why Hollywood and, uh, and the elites, this is why they love Elensky, because he's one of them, isn't he? But it definitely screams elitism without a doubt. But more importantly, it is... Uh, it is a slap in the face, a disgusting slap in the face to the Ukrainians who are being drafted, as I said before, who are being drafted to fight in a war that they don't want to fight in, who are dying on the front lines, who are being sent to their death, who are being maimed, maimed injured, uh, leaving the battlefield with probably lifelong psychological uh, trauma all of these things and i'm not even getting into the economic situation of ukraine but uh all of this all of this is happening in ukraine and Elensky and his wife decide to do a photo shoot for uh for vogue uh, <laughs> um <laughs> okay <laughs> that was interesting but um yeah so what a in such bad taste this was in such bad taste, but uh, I've, I've said it now for a while that uh, for Alensky and the Alensky regime, they are fighting a media war. This is, this is where they're most comfortable. This is the type of war they want to fight. This is the type of conflict that they can, that they feel they can win at. And uh, the reality on the ground is, is almost secondary to them. What's more important for them are likes and shares and uh, eventually moving into their Miami mansion and hanging out with, uh, with LeBron James and Ellen DeGeneres and uh, who else? Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie and uh, all of these types of people. That's what's really important to, uh, to them and to their whole cast and crew, the directors and producers who are in their government. This is, without a doubt, for them, the most important thing is, uh, is the media optics uh, part of this conflict. And I just thought, I, I thought the video was incredible to see how, how much of a good time they're having. And just the fact that, uh, that you had the Vogue team coming in there to prepare the narrative, you know, they're, you can see by the images, they've got the, the, the areas which have, uh, which have been hit by by bombs or artillery they've got those picked out they've got the cameras there they're going to paint the entire narrative of uh, Olena Zelenska and uh, Elensky as the uh, as the wartime leaders of Ukraine fighting for for the world's freedom against Putin you know they're they're painting that whole narrative and they don't they don't have a problem putting up the videos and the photos on social media you know they don't they don't want to hide any of the of the scenes that uh, that took place, right? The backstage scenes of this uh, this propaganda puff piece. So that is the first clown world. The second clown world has to do with uh, who else? Boris Johnson. So um, the Telegraph is saying that the conservative Tory party members actually believe that Boris Johnson would be a good. NATO Secretary General. So Stoltenberg is Stoltenberg is on, is on the way out in uh, September, and they're going to need a, need a replacement. And 
the UK, the Tories are saying Boris is the right man for the job because he did such a good job in uh, getting weapons to Ukraine. He should be the uh, NATO Secretary General. So once again, an incompetent, clownish buffoon leader of a collective West country, instead of being punished for destroying his country, sending his country over the cliff, he's going to get promoted up. Just like Vander Crazy, just like Lagarde, Boris Johnson, the same thing. He's going to get tucked away in one of these globalist institutions. He's going to make a fat, tax-free salary, and he's going to run around the world blaming Putin for everything and screaming for war with Russia. And uh, we saw Boris Johnson's managerial skills as prime minister of uh, the UK. I'm sure he's going to bring those managerial skills to uh, NATO head offices in Brussels and he's going to do a real bang up job. <laughs> I mean, he's going to he's going to suck. He is going to suck it up big time. I'm sure the Russians are going to be happy to see Boris there as secretary general, because if you had to choose between Stoltenberg and, and Boris Johnson, well, Boris is, is, is much more incompetent than, uh, than Jan Stoltenberg, that's for sure. But uh, yeah, promote it up, Boris Johnson. And the United States would really like to see Boris Johnson be um, the NATO Secretary General because they would like to, to have someone that's not so European, according to sources, telegraph sources in, uh, in the U.S. government. They would like someone who's in the U.K. because according to the United States... The UK is going to do whatever the US tells it to do. So for them, it's it's even better to have Boris there. Not that Stoltenberg ever questioned what the US told them to do, but still, they probably feel more safe with uh, Boris at the helm. So that's the clown world. Now you can see why Boris Johnson was like training at, uh, at the military base in Yorkshire with UK and Ukrainian troops. I wonder if he was trying to to show NATO that he was uh, he was up for the job as Secretary General, <laughs> throwing the grenade and all. I'm sure that uh, everyone saw Boris Johnson throwing that grenade, and they said, "Wow, this guy should be the next Secretary General of NATO." Look at him throw that grenade. <laughs> anyway, that is the video, guys. The Duran.locals.com. Check out Alexandra's channel. Check out the Duran's channel. Rumble Odyssey. Shoot and telegram. Take care.